and it's day one and you walking in there on the first day, man, you in there, man. But you feel something. It's right in here, man. And it's screaming and it's yelling and it's saying, release me. And it's saying, I am the number one determinant of the success or failure of my students. Hey, y'all, when you get back, kick some butt, and I'll see you in the winner's circle celebrating your victory. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. You got this. You got this. You got this. Thank you, everybody. And we are live. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to week 191 of the AP and New Principles Academy. Let me see what we got here this morning. Let me let me scroll way back up here. We got Ricardo Giannis, my man in the building. Mona Obamolak is here. Takesha High, Renee Graham in the building. Montclair, New Jersey in the building representing. We got Constance Sherrod, Scott Wiley, Rodney Richardson, Marsha Poe all the way out there in San Diego. We got uh, Taki, uh, Tashika Truesdale. You probably say he, he messes that up every week. Tashika Truesdale is in the building. Lynette Wilson, Lisa DeBose Walker, Michael Benton, uh, Dot McKeever Jeter. That's principal Dot McKeever Jeter, the legend. Dot McKeever Jeter in the building. John Herrick's Dr. Sheikah Houston is just dropping that knowledge with her guest, Dr. Gallman, a few minutes ago on Create and Educate. Make sure you tune in every Saturday morning at 1030. We got Stacey L. Joy in the building. Central Hicks. Hafiz Melton is in the building. Uh, Janetta Vaughn is in the building. Uh, Ashton Barnes, Rashad Davis, A.J. Bryan. Is that, is that one of my former students? I can't make out the picture. Uh, Jacqueline Harriet up there in Nova Scotia is here. Asia Burnett, Dr. Rella Hicks. My man, Keena Walker is in the building. We got uh, Charlena Hadi. Uh, where we at? Where we at? Where we at? Melissa Jones, Chunu, hit the share button as you come in, folks. Hit the retweet button as we as you come in. We got an important conversation today, and I want you all to get this. So make sure, and I want some other folks to get it. They may be running around shopping. You know, you could go to the mall shop and have the phone, have the Bluetooth right in your ear, have the phone in your pocket, and no, nobody don't even know what you're doing, right? So just uh, no excuses. Them days are gone. Like I, I, I gotta go shopping now. Nah, you can, you could bring me right to the mall right you could bring me right to the restaurant if you having brunch you know whatever it is you could you can bring me along right uh jasmine harris out there in california i was getting ready to post on uh on sean's page and by the way sean hurt 10 o'clock every saturday morning i was getting ready to post on his thread jasmine i said man jasmine's up at seven o'clock in the morning that is some serious 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 and serious commitment um you and marcia poe uh, I don't know if Marsha's on for for Sean that early, but I know Jasmine, you on at seven o'clock for Sean Pacific time, and um, and then just rock all the way through to to myself. So I appreciate that immensely. Um, where we at? Where we at? And there is Sean. There's Principal Sean right there. So great job again this morning, as always, sir. Sean her ten o'clock Facebook Live every Saturday morning, uh, Eastern time. Alan Coward, I'm getting ready to end it, y'all. I came on a couple minutes early. Yolanda McKinney's in the building. Uh, Sharice Ayers, always good to see you, Sharice. And if, if you guys, um, fam, Sharice was my guest like two years ago. Scroll way back. We had a powerful conversation. She was part of my series, and I'm, I'm going to start it back up soon at some point, uh, um, Leading While Black. And she was, uh, I think she was like my first guest that I had on where we, where we did that series. There were like five different sessions I did. So go back and check that out, Leading While Black. You know, some perspectives on just being in black skin while leading. It is very different. Uh, Bonnie Wilbon, Wilburn, Wilborn. 
is in the building. Otis, Principal Otis Kitchen II is in the building. Tiffany Riddick's Adams, Rolanda Jones is in the building. There's Josh Tovar, MPA Jaguars. He's the other, he's the final component to the to the Fantastic Four. Uh, he's seven o'clock with Dean Packard on Sunday nights, seven o'clock Eastern time, right? So uh, make sure you join him. So the Fantastic Four, I'll say this again at the end, but I know a lot of you won't be with me toward the very end, but we'll say it now. The Fantastic Four, we're coming back together for the third time next Saturday. We're not doing an interview format. We're doing a roundtable format. We're just going to let it flow. So you want to you be here. We're going to cover a lot of ground on um December 30th, I guess it is. Yeah, December 30th. So be with us next Saturday. You know, I don't stop for holidays, man. A holiday will be here Monday. The season is here now, but you know, I don't I don't stop, man. I did this on Christmas Day when Christmas was on a Saturday. I did this on New Year's Day when New Year's was on a Saturday. And uh that's 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 how I get down. When Fourth of July is on a Saturday, I do it then. If Thanksgiving ever came on a Saturday, which we know it won't, I'll do it then. Whatever the holiday is, I do it then. I do it on my birthday, I do it on vacation day, I do it whenever. Uh, this is this is my commitment on Saturday mornings at 1055 Eastern time. Uh, I, let me see if I see any local homies that I just need to shout out before I close it. I cl yeah. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Lance Rogers, man. Man, Lance, my brother. You know, we got to talk sometime, man. This is my guy, Lance Rogers. We used to sit. He, he had a tree house in his backyard when we were like in. I think I was in fifth. He was in fifth grade and I was in sixth grade, something like that. But we used to sit up in the treehouse and just rap, man. And then his sister became a member of my staff when I was a principal. So it was just an amazing thing, man. G great to see you, Lance. You you making my day just seeing your name. Lance Rogers, my brother. All right, y'all, that's, that's, that's a good one to end on. I'm going to end it right there. Hit the share button. Hit the retweet button. Let them know we're here. We are here. We are here live during this Christmas season, Kwanzaa season. We're here. But let me say formally to everybody now, good morning greetings welcome to week 191 of the ap and new principles academy and as i get i'm transitioning back to just doing it this way as i always say eh, i was trying to say the old one but i'm saying listen y'all i don't know how y'all feel i don't know how y'all feeling but i'm hope you feeling good in this moment we know that everybody doesn't have necessarily reason to feel good in this moment for a plethora of different reasons. But keep in mind that you are in leadership and there's a certain energy, excitement, enthusiasm, passion, determination that you must bring along with your role on a regular basis. So I'm in work mode right now. Y'all are, you know, y'all, y'all is in chill mode, recipient, taking it all in. But I'm, I'm in work mode. I've been working for a week on this agenda, right? So let me let you know how I feel despite the, and, and plus I spoke this week. A lot of people shut it down earlier in the month. I, I did a whole, I spoke this week. So I'm letting you know that I'm on fire. Woo! Woo! It's always good to get that out of me too, man. You know, I, I, it's a release but it's reflective of how i feel right so 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 tell uh let me let me go through this agenda real quick because i i got a guest here man she had a she had a, a, a i don't even want to say a different kind of evening as part her her evening is 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 what happens in her world relative to the work she does so she'll we'll talk about that in a little while but let me say first shout out to south orange maplewood school district um that's south orange maplewood new jersey Shout out to them. I got an, I had an opportunity to speak to the entire administrative team on um, Wednesday night. Um, and, and one of our family members, Lynn Irby, Principal Lynn Irby, she uh, always hooks that up. So great to see you, Principal Irby, and great to be in the presence of South Orange Maplewood School District Administration. We, I think we had a great evening. I know I was dropping a lot of stuff on y'all, but I think it was good stuff uh, to take into the new year. Um, welcome to the first timers. If this is in fact your first time, you've missed 190 sessions. So there's a lot to make up, but you can go to the YouTube channel at AP and New Principles Academy, hit the subscribe button, hit that notifications button so that you know when we go live and then just binge watch, you know, just watch them all, man. Right, 190 sessions. I mean, <laughs> you can't go wrong. I, I would dare say 
can no graduate school program touch them 190. I, I mean, I'm, I'm going to put it out there because 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 it's not just me. I've had at least 150 guests on here, you know, and, and you know, just just folks doing the work, some with these international reputations, national reputations, you know, just a plethora of people. It, it's, it's, it's no graduate school course that could touch this. And quite frankly, I know that graduate school programs use these videos because they tell me or sometimes they'll just zoom me in. So so you want to make sure that you are watching all 190, all 191. Hit that share button. Hit that retweet button. Let them know. The AP and New Principles Academy Facebook page, man. Some of y'all sleeping on that still. That's when I write the written commentary. I wrote a whole blog last week. I, I, I can't even remember what the topic was, but it but it but it but it had a it had about 1,200 uh, views on my um, my blog page. So if you didn't see it, just go to Principal Cafe Lay Writes, and it's sitting right there on the top. Right, take a look at it. I'll have another one tomorrow morning um the books real quick because it's holiday season i gotta go through these man we got the assistant principal 50 you could still get your copy man and get it to your loved one before christmas if you if you're a prime member and do it now amazon the assistant principal identity this joint y'all took it up to number six on amazon like three times yesterday why you ain't take me to five though man right but it was at number six this morning right so i think like three times man this is an old book i wrote it in 2019 but it's still relevant somebody said 19 that's not old i know the aspiring principal 50 the principal 50 and is my school a better school because i lead it right you go to amazon right now get the other device and get those books man all right, I'm getting ready to get my, my guest up here. Real quick, y'all, my monologue today, uh, a little different. I'm going to be short with it, though. I want I want to dedicate today to my, my late maternal grandmother. Uh, today is her birthday. Let me just put a little little small picture of, of, of her up there. That's that's uh, my grandmother, Nana Roselle Smith. Uh, she was she was born in uh, in, in 1912, approximately. Right. You know, back in them days, everybody didn't have that birth certificate. Right. So it, it, between anywhere between uh, between 11 to 15 is when she was born. But real quick, y'all, I, I did a whole session on her like a year, about two years ago. Man came out of the south in Virginia, worked as a sharecropper, which is which is essentially slavery. Right. Uh, if you don't know what sharecropping is, uh, Google it later on and came up here to the north because uh, sharecropping wasn't the way to live came up here worked as a maid cleaned and cooked for white families um all her adult life up here brought her 10 or 11 siblings up here and they she she purchased a one family three-story house in east Orange, new jersey 76 effort street and um i grew up in that house she brought her 11 i guess 10 or 11 siblings up here get them out of the south and they lived up north in east Orange, new jersey with her right and eventually i was born and lived there and um and then at the age of 60 hear me somebody the age of 60 this is probably partly where i get my fire she decided to go to nursing school and get her nursing uh, certification and became a full-time va veterans administration nurse um at the age of 60 right or 61 right and did that until retirement so it's never too late to chase your dream and, it's, and see, I got that I got that example of my grandmother in my blood. It's flowing through my veins. It's never too late. So I just wanted to wanted to holler at you about that. Dedicate this session 191 to the life of my grandmother, Roselle Smith, who I who was affectionately known by me as Nana. Right. Myself and my cousin. That's what we called her, Nana. Um, real quick. Uh, Kwanzaa is coming up on uh, Tuesday, December 26th through January 1st. Seven days. We're going to be on live on black on on black educators rock hosted by our president of black educators rock dr melissa chester our ceo uh chief um i, I can't i can't even speak right now see she's she's a ceo chief executive officer so uh we're going to be on at eight o'clock every day of kwanzaa um eight o'clock for an hour my day will be kuji chakalia day self-determination that'll be on tuesday on um on on wednesday night right so uh get with us i have it on my page i'm gonna share it from black educators rock it'll be on my page i'll be watching all of them but i'll be on the screen on the second day of kwanzaa wednesday night eight o'clock eastern time kuji chagalia self-determination along with the principal out in brooklyn and we'll talk more about that later 
with that said, I got a, I got a guest here, so I'm ready to bring you up, Keisha. I'm ready to bring up my guest. So let me, let me, let me get her in here, and we will get it rocking. That's not the background I want. So hold on, I'm messing up, man. I'm trying to do too many things at one time. Where we at? Here we at. Just hang, hang with me for a second. We get this right. Here we go. All right, there we go. There we go. Keisha Yuri, good to see you. Good morning, good morning, good morning. I hear you over there on fire, so I'm I'm on fire as well. Good morning, and thank you for having me. I, hey, I'm I'm glad to have you. We we scheduled this uh, a long time ago, and uh, I've been I've been every I look at my calendar every 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 now and then, like when is when is, when do I have Keisha on here? Man? Uh -huh. I'm I'm ready to do this one, man. So uh, here we are. I think we waited like four months, right? We did. We certainly yeah. did. Yep. But here we are. Here we are. Hey, folks out there, fam, I'm calling this a conversation on violence prevention and trauma recovery in schools. And, and I'm going to read this bio right quick. And I want you to know everything about our guest. And I want you to tell somebody, you know, hit the hit the share button, retweet, repost, you know, the various platforms that we're on. We're on the force or whatever language they use. Just use that and, and let folks know. And, and, and after I read the bio, before we jump in, I'm going to let you know how Keisha spend her night because it's 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 just real it's real stuff you know it's, it's it's stuff we really deal with uh when we when we talk about who we are as as, as a society so let me read this uh she sent me the long version and i'm gonna I'm read i, I just want to read it all lakeisha yuri is a proud native of newark new jersey who has achieved the status of an accomplished master's level licensed clinical social worker and currently serves as director of newark's office of violence prevention and and trauma recovery. Uh, Lakeisha's remarkable journey has been marked by exceptional leadership and an unwavering dedication to community service. With a specialized focus on trauma, domestic violence, sexual assault, community violence, Lakeisha has become a sought after community based therapist. Her unique skill set involves activating trauma focused wraparound services and community based interventions aimed at healing communities in need. Beyond her clinical work, Lakeisha is the visionary founder of Beta Kappa Sigma Black and Latino Sorority Incorporated. Through this organization, she empowers young women by fostering a sense of culture, achievement, and excellence. Her impact on empowering women earned her prestigious accolades, including na the National Coalition of 100 Black Women Incorporated, Women of Achievement Award, and the Civic Awareness of Public Safety Award in 2022. In, 2000, in 2009, Lakeisha co-founded the Newark Anti-Violence Coalition, where she served as the former chairwoman. This coalition has been a driving force in raising awareness and providing crucial support to affected families and educating the community on violence prevention. Lakeisha's relentless commitment to the public safety and was honored with the Essex County Prosecutor's Office Woman, Women's History Month Top Achievement in Public Safety Award in 2021. Lakeisha's advocacy extends to vital issues such as community pol policing, police reform, and establishment of a civilian complaint review board in Newark. Her dedication to these causes and her community has earned her respect and recognition. Currently pursuing her doctoral degree at the University of Southern California, Lakeisha plans to utilize her research and evaluation skills to support community-based organizations and city government in addressing crime and violence, further solidifying her commitment to community wellness. Lakeisha's activism goes beyond her professional role. She's been at the forefront organizing impactful rallies, protests, and town hall meetings. Her active engagement with the community has been an instrumental in decreasing crime and violence, leading to be her being awarded the Inspired by You Community Service Award in 2022. Lastly, Lakeisha Yuri is not just a local figure. She has made a significant impact nationally. Her unwavering commitment to public service and community wellness has earned her the respect and admiration of many. Lakeisha's journey is a testament to the power of dedicated individuals in healing and strengthening our communities. That's a lot. And, 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 and I got to tell you, Lakeisha, I read this uh, and I'm, I'm and you know, I'm used to calling you Keisha. Right. And, and, and um, I, I read this a few times and I, I ain't know half this stuff, man. You, 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 you a silent warrior. You doing, you doing big things, getting all these accolades and, and, and folks, I, I, I'm sure there's a lot of folks that don't even realize it. Like I certainly didn't realize you were pursuing that doctorate degree. 
So, you know, like I told Reginald Bledsoe on his page the other day, um, your best is nowhere near, nowhere near. Cause you, you, you got, you got so many things that's going to just going to just emanate out of you with what you, what you pour into the world. And I'm, you know, I'm just, I'm just happy to be able to watch it and observe it and, and, and be inspired and influenced by it. Right. So, um, let's go, let's go. Hey, y'all, y'all ready, man. All them platforms, hit that share button, retweet, repost, whatever it is, tag somebody, go to them Facebook leader, leadership groups and let them know that, uh, we're here. Hey, hey, hey Keisha, um, when when you're wearing that social worker's hat you know because i know you don't wear it 24 7. yeah but when but when you do wear it who is keisha yuri so for so long right as we talked about me being into activism and organizing and, and being on the front lines and in the streets for so long many people didn't even know that i was a social worker um but the social work and the activism and the advocacy and the organizing um, is true social work. Um, being able to speak for people when they don't have a voice, being able to help make choices for people who don't have choice. Um, and so Keisha um, being a social worker is Keisha advocating for those people um, who don't know their rights, who don't know um, how to speak for themselves, who sometimes can't even show up for themselves. Um, and so that looks like being in a city council meeting, being at the school, being at the hospital, being in the mayor's office, being everywhere where people um, are not able to to be heard, but beyond being heard, feeling like they're not getting the things that they need and they can't articulate the needs. And so we know that we have so many you know issues in our communities, but being able to um, to do something about it, right? Social workers are the people that you call when you don't know when nobody knows what else to do call a social worker, they're going to figure it out. So the, the, we're the problem solvers. And that's who, who I am for the community. You know, you, 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 you said a lot there. In fact, I need to get my ink pen. You, 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 you said a lot. And, and because like, like I'm, I'm, I'm going to make an assumption here that you kind of see the world through the lens of a social worker. And, 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 and with me, I see the world through the lens of an educator. Right. right. It's like I could be watching sports and I'm I'm seeing things happening on the court. I'm seeing things happening on the field and I'm, I'm, I'm receiving it as an educator in terms of how can I use that? Right. So when you said that there are folks out there and they don't even recognize what they see. Right. I thought about the you know, I could think about anybody in the school building, but I want to go to leadership because that's who's watching this morning. Right. Mm hmm. There are things that happen in a school as it may relate to trauma, as right. it relates to violence. This person is a leader of a principal, a, 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 an assistant uh, principal, a superintendent of schools. It's happening before your eyes. But I think you and I can conclude, even though I see it, I don't understand it. Right. I don't know what. I'm looking at, although it's unfolding two feet in front of me. Speak to that to me. Speak to that. Speak to that for us for a moment relative to. So therefore, what do we do? So I would say if you was, you know, principal Confele, right? And I would say superintendent of schools um, and school leaders, some of the things that I do or have done is is the relationship, right? So I create relationships with the people and community. I believe in community-based strategies, right? And so the school is where the students spend most of their time, right? And so we, I see the person saying trauma-informed schools, which is important because we don't have trauma-informed schools. We, we barely have community-based, you know, kind of schools because things are, are, are not like they used to be in terms of community-based. And so the relationship that I've been able to build with the superintendent, the assistant superintendent and some of the principals is for us to be able to let me identify, help let me tell you the people in the community that are credible, right, that can help you with your students. And so I would say uh, a strategy like this week that we use, we have um, our schools are out, right, students are out for the next two weeks and our um we have these basketball games and tournaments that's going to happen, but we know we have schools that are at war, 
with some of our students are fighting an increase in school violence that's happening. And so we have to have a strategy and, and, and think and be ahead of that. And so we have about, I have about 30 community-based organizations that I just funded through the city to be able to um, be on top of those things. So this week we're not, we have school passes. We have safe passage that we use where we have organizations that are standing outside the schools in those passageways in the community to make sure school kids get to school safe. But beyond them getting to school safe, we're building relationship with them so that they see us every day. We're creating safety for them and they, they have a sense of trust. And so a huge issue is trust. A huge issue is students don't feel safe. And so the school is supposed to be the safe zone. Mm. Um, and so you need people in those corridors to help them get there safely and after school. And so now I told all the organizations, safe passage is now at the basketball games. It's not at the schools because school is out. You have to be at the basketball games, the football games, the extra curricular activities. We have to be there on the lunch periods. You have to be there at the after school programs and it has to be people that they trust, people that's credible. And as we have trauma informed schools, beyond being trauma informed, we need trauma engaged schools. Mm. So after you're informed, then what? It's not enough just to be informed. You have to be able to engage. You have to be able to have trust. You have to be able to now change your policies because we need policy changes because a lot of the policies um, are tying hands where we can't get the students what they need. A lot of our policies are antiquated in our school systems. And we have to push and fight as leaders to be able to fight these policies that no longer make sense for our students. We have to fight these policies because our students are being sexually abused. They are bringing guns to school. They are being um, bullied. And a lot of what we're finding is that all of the stuff that's um, violence based is already happening on social media. So you need a person, whether we have attendance officers, but we need a social media officer. You need a person that's only monitoring social media so that you understand what's happening because it's happening before they get to school, after school, outside in the metaverse. And so because many of us as administrators don't understand the metaverse and we don't think the metaverse is important, then we miss all of those signs um, that's happening. Um, and so we have, we have police officers in the schools and some schools need police officers, some schools don't, right? We need a community-based approach. We need a trauma-engaged approach, and we need to be activated in these schools um, just differently than we have been before. Wow, you you we gonna get into all that you get. You gave us some stuff. I'm looking at these comments, man. Hey, y'all, let somebody know we're here, and we 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 got a we got a very important topic that we're discussing. I I I, st I still want to I still want to get into you a little bit more. Okay, so, social work where where's the passion for social work coming from for you the passion for social work comes for me growing up i'm born and raised in the city of newark um and i always wanted to be a, a mortician um and me wanting to be a mortician came by way of me just wanting to have a job that nobody else could take from me we know that people are always going to be employed in the the funeral business and that's what i wanted to do Hmm. And so when I, I, I went to college, I went to Ramapo College, um, I went there and I was going to major. You have to do two years in social sciences and then you transfer to be to do mortuary science in another school. And so my first year of college, my dad passed away. And then eight months later, my mom passed away. Um, and so life became different, right? And so I'm no different from a lot of these students, right? Life becomes very different and you need people that can support you to help you to be able to still pursue your hopes and dreams. And I had those educators at the college. I had those um, counselors at the college. I had an EOF counselor um, that, and counselors that helped me um, and supported me. And so ultimately, because life became different and my support and my security blanket is now gone because both my parents were gone, then I needed to change lanes. And so being a mortician, I, I couldn't, I didn't have the capacity to change schools and, and do it the route. So I just said that if I'm going to do two years in social sciences, then I might as well do four. And then I took the assessment that you take and it said, you should be a social worker. Um, and I kind of just, you know, followed it through out of survival, honestly. 
Um, and out of just, all right, I need to survive in this world now. I don't have any parents. What am I going to do? I got to do what I'm good at. Um, and so I've always been personality character wise, always been good at making sure people felt safe. I've always been good at um, organizing and, and being the person out front. And so personality wise, it just fit. But what, what pushed me to get into the world of like community and organizing and probably this violence piece is, is trauma, right? It's having situations that affected my life. And I said, I don't want anybody else to have to go through that. Um, and I don't want anybody else to have to um, do this by themselves because we didn't have a lot of um, people to, to, to help guide you through it, to advocate for you. I needed somebody to save the day for me. I needed what I didn't have. And I said, I'm going to be who I didn't have. Um, and so my first job out of college was a life skills program for kids who were in, um, in um, DIFUS right, in the social welfare system. And that was my first job. And that propelled me to get my master's degree to help these kids who didn't have parents, who was out here um, living on the streets and doing different things. And so I said, I wanted to do that and I wanted to help them. And so most people say, I just want to help people, but help people how? Yeah. Um, and so I needed to be clear about how I wanted to help people. And I needed to be the the gap. I needed to be the person. I needed to be the, the the savior, if you will. And I know that we don't, you know, necessarily do saviors, but sometimes we just need somebody to show up and save the day. And my social work was going to be that someone to just show up and save the day. Well, you know, go, going back to mortuary, um, I know my mom probably sat up straight and tall when you said that she, she, she hasn't missed one of these sessions yet of 191. And you ever heard of Cushney Funeral Home in East Orange? Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's, that, that was my mother. Wow. Uh, my, my mother married George Cushney and, oh. and she became the director when he passed. She went to mortuary school and she um, became the director of Cushney Funeral Home. So she would have she would have loved to have brought you in and trained you. You remember Brother Muhammad uh, with, with the van and all that uh, in North Tyrone? Tyrone. Yeah, he, yeah. He, he, he trained. He trained under them. Oh, that's amazing. Morticians yeah. are care. Certainly. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. All uh, right, so let me start reminiscing. We'll talk more about that later. You know, I want you you you, you touched on the the activism side, and I would be remiss if I didn't go there as well. As as a community activist, then who's Keisha Yuri in that regard? Um, Keisha Yuri is um, the activist um, who was on the front lines. So as we talk about the North Anti Violence Coalition. Um, North Anti-Violence Coalition was founded in 2009, but probably even before that, uh, where people who were tired of the, the senseless violence that was happening in our communities um, to just bring awareness and was speaking up about it. But what propelled me was having my brother shot. So the reason I moved out of the city of Newark when I was 21, I was home from college one weekend and a person came and knocked on the door and asked for my brother. He was asleep. And I told the person, well, he's asleep, but I'll let him know that you came. And he was asking questions and talking to me. And I said, OK, you know, I'll let him know you came. And the next morning, my brother left out the house without me being able to tell him. And that same person shot him down the street. And someone came and, and said to me, your brother got shot. And luckily he lived. But when we you know, talked about who the person was, it was the same person that came and knocked on the door. And so that person could have shot and killed me as well. But by the grace of God, that didn't happen. And so overnight, you didn't have to leave your house because if he came that day, he'll come back another day. Um, and so safety now becomes an issue. I've never not felt safe because I've lived in this house for 21 years. I've lived in this neighborhood my whole life and I never not felt safe. Um, and so activism for me was being in a hospital, not just with him, but with former guys that I dated who was shot and killed in the city as well. And no one was there. Nobody showed up. Um, and you were just there by yourself. There was nobody to advocate to the doctors or the nurses for you. There was no one to tell the police to stop treating you so aggressively. There was no one there to, to, to advocate. And so I said, that's what I want to do. I'm going to advocate for those people who so no one has to feel this way. So the North Anti-Violence Coalition ultimately um, birthed out of a woman by the name of Nakisha Allen, who was shot and killed in the city. 
And because there was no outrage, it was business as usual. People decided to do something. So ultimately, Mayor Baraka, he wasn't the mayor at that time. He was in activism and most people were in activism, um, just put out a text message and people came to the location um, and they began to speak out against the violence. And from that point going forward, every Wednesday for 155 weeks, low, um, rain, sleet, snow, we were out there rallying and protesting against the violence um, that was happening in the community because it was no longer a law enforcement issue. It's a community issue. We know who did it. We know why it happened. It landed on your doorstep. You didn't say anything. So now it's on my doorstep. And so now we are telling the community that you have a responsibility to public safety. And so we don't trust law enforcement. We don't trust the police. We're not going to talk to them, but we trust each other or we have some level of relationship. You got to tell us. And so we became like an entity in the community to be able to speak out against violence and declaring violence a public health issue. And one of the, the other demands that we had was around the Amistad being taught in the schools, that we wanted black and brown history taught in the schools, because if I love myself and I know about myself, I'm less likely to commit violence against people who look like me. Right. And we had um, demands around ed education, around employment. We need employment because violence is about financial. Right. Violence is about poverty. Um, and so we asked the Bloods and Crips to put their guns down as well. Um, but that Amistad one was important. And finally, we wanted violence declared a public health issue. And so for educators, school-based violence is a public health issue, and we have to treat it as such. Let me, uh, for the folks, there's a, there's a lot of Norkers on here right now. There's a lot of Jersey folks on here now. But there's also a, there's a national audience here. And, and I know that many probably don't know what you mean by Amistad. And I, and I want to paint a picture of of what you were saying about Newark Anti-Violence Coalition as far as what that looked like uh, starting with 2009. And real quick, folks, for the national audience, um, there will be a shooting somewhere in, the, in Newark. So with this group of folks who became this organization, and, and quite frankly, I was there as well in the beginning stages, um, they would take over an intersection and just literally declare it right this because it happened in the vicinity and now have this rally all no traffic is going through that area at all so buses everything everything stops because the priority is the fact that there was another shooting in that vicinity there was another life lost perhaps in that vicinity there was another shooter in that vicinity so therefore it had to be addressed right and again the mayor the current mayor wasn't mayor then he was an he was an activist right and now here he is the mayor of Newark, mayor raz baraka and then what you said about the Amistad, and I want to tie this because this is where I'm going now, education, the schools. The Amistad Act is, is, is a law, folks, in Jersey, 2002, that said African-American history is mandated in New Jersey school districts, which there are over 600 kindergarten through 12th grade. Well, of the 600 some odd districts in New Jersey, you'd be hard pressed to find one this, this, this completely or fully compliant to what the legislation is around the Amistad Act, right? So I wanna take that and tie that right here, Keisha. As a teacher, and I'm, I'm talking about me now, I taught from 88 until 90, um, 98. And the Amistad wasn't law yet, but make no mistake about it. And I wanna tie this into that word activism, that the Amistad, breathe life in my classroom mm -hmm. right so mm -hmm. i'm in east orange new jersey all the students are black and i'm ensuring for the reasons you stated that these young people recognize who they are who that is in their mirror when they look in it on a regular basis so when we talk about that and couple it with activism so i'm not just a teacher imparts information but for me, I said, simultaneously, I got to fight for children every day in that classroom. I got to advocate for children every day in that classroom. To the fam out there, I want y'all to hear me. I'm going to say this again. I know I'm not the guest. Keisha's a guest. But let me just say this again. <laughs> in addition to teaching content, important information, math, science, language, arts, social studies, I got to fight. Right. For the 25 in my room, I was departmentalized. So for the 120, the 150 that I saw every day, I got to fight for. Them. 
I got to advocate for them. I got to prepare them for a world as it as it exists. Right. So then the Amistad comes. I'm a new principal. I'm a brand new principal when the Amistad comes. And I got that same mentality. I'm going to lead this school, but I got to fight for these kids. I got to I, I got to advocate for these kids. I got to make sure that when they leave me and never see me again, that they're prepared for that next level in life. So, so I'm saying all that, Keisha, to say this. When you think of activism and you think of teacher or you think of principal, what is what is because because we got an education audience watching. What does a leader activist look like in the eyes of Keisha Yuri? And I know we could use Raz Baraka as our example, right? But just give it to us. So a leader activist looks like you, right? A leader activist looks like um, Raz Baraka because he started out with, as a, a principal, as a teacher, right? Yeah. And once you're in the classroom and you have that experience, you have a different connection to students and then you have a different relationship. And then once you become an administrator, then you have a different obligation. And so it's not just an individualized. Now it becomes a collective. Um, and so that looks like having a collective impact model mindset that everything is us. Right. I am because we are. We are because I am. Right. And it has to be that because what doesn't land on your doorstep today lands on someone else's. Right. And it all comes back, you know, all together. And so when um, the mayor, you know, ultimately was 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 starting to, you know, be out there in activism, he was the people's mayor for us. He wasn't out. Cory Booker was the mayor at the time. We was trying to get violence declared a public health issue because we was losing. We had over 100 homicides. Right. And so we were losing our young people. We were youth losing women and children. And there was no outrage. People were just going business as usual. And it was, and people became desensitized and, and it was disheartening and heartbreaking. And so the passion comes from that. When you see young people laying on the ground, when you see children having to run and, and you have to go into school lockdowns, when you see and there's nothing you can do about it. Right. But really trying to figure out ways to prevent it versus having to be act, be act, reactive to it. Um, that fuels your fire to say, I have to do something different. I have to do something more. I have to fight for these students. We have to um, ultimately create some policy changes. I have to be different. I have to do something different so that I can get something different. And that's the only way that you that you do that. And whether it is from a community place, from a, a, a institution place. Right. It's the same mindset. It's the same thing. Collective impact, working together, partnership. So what happens is the schools become siloed. Right. If I'm in this building, this is my building. This is all that I'm responsible for. And I'm in this district. Right. And so when people don't see themselves as a part of the community, when administrators don't see themselves outside of their buildings, when superintendents don't see themselves outside of that, then we have more of the same. And so until we can see something better, something different, and until it lands on your doorstep and you see certain things, then you're not going to be activated. Right. And so while we're talking about someone put mm -hmm. trauma informed, um, someone put trauma informed and I said trauma engaged, then we go all the way to being activated. What are you activated for? What are you activating for? Or to beyond the students is families systems that we're talking about. We are part of juvenile justice systems. Now our young people are involved in the justice systems, right? So we're looking at all these systems and it's really us having to change systems. So activism looks like us being able to tear down these systems that are really truly based on structural racism, right? And we know those things and we ultimately know white supremacy. So until you recognize those things, then you are going to perpetuate the system that you are part of. Perpetuate a system that you are a part of. Let's 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 build. You know, this audience, Keisha, you got on the one hand, you got these you got urban administrators and within your urban administrators, you have some, maybe many. It's, you know, I can't engage it who are who are battling violence in its many forms on a continual basis. So that's on one hand. On another hand, you got suburban leaders who are on the call who violence is 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 not within their orbit. You know, right. it is it's, it's minimal. 
right so you got these two extremes and then you got everybody that's in between so at various different levels you're dealing with with violence so you and i i'm a product of east orange which is urban you're a product of newark which is urban both here in new jersey right so we we, we we've dealt with our ch our share i'm asking you thinking again about this audience and in, in in keeping on your, your 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 social worker and your activism hat what is your message to these urban principles these 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 urban assistant principles about their roles in 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 terms of being able to curb this violence that occurs in their schools so what i would say is um first we have to acknowledge it and be honest about it right because most of the administrators don't want to feel like they have this issue um, because the, you know, data, statistics, evaluations, right? You, you don't want to be, you know, stigmatized. You don't want to be um, that you are, you know, a part of that. But what I've found is that once we recognize it, then we can do something about it. And so then, you know, some of the strategies that I would say is um, ultimately us beefing up our security measures. Um, some of our schools look like facilities and prisons and i hate to say that right so i would say we have to change the way that our schools look firstly right environment plays a a, a, ish, a, a huge factor in what the school looks like um energy plays a huge you know um and things that we we expose them to but i would say security measures um ultimately um, limiting like access points and having like surveillance all of those things the security guards um, but really, um, people that they relate to, people that look like them. I don't necessarily think we have to have a lot of police officers and security guards in buildings, but you, you know, certainly know your school's better than anyone and what you need. But they also need community people. They need people who look like them, people who are relatable, younger people who can help do conflict resolution, who can help with problem solving, who can help with some of those things. I went to training in New York with Erica Ford and they have a school-based program um, where they have a transformation room and it is their people and the outreach workers, um, people who are, you know, maybe have been formerly incarcerated or people who are from the community um, that they relate to. And the students get to go to this transformation room when they're having issues. And it may not always be violence-based. It may be if they're just not having a good day today. Um, and it's not always disciplinary, um, but it's, it's, it's transformative and it's restorative-based, right? So now we're doing restorative work in the, in the schools. Um, and they're there every day and these students feel comfortable with them. And so there's not many schools that have a transformation room right the transformation room is a disciplinary room because they got suspended or something like that but we need something different we need something where they can just decompress because their grandmother died yesterday they need a place that they can decompress because their mother is getting hot or their father is incarcerated or whatever it is and today is just not a, i don't want to do classwork and i shouldn't have to do classwork right where we can focus on emotional and social right um, and a lot of times that's where we are lacking in our schools, that social emotional learning piece. And so we're doing it because we got to check the box, but we got to do it in real life. Yeah. Um, and so policies, I talked about that training, right? Training our school personnel is important, training staff, um, training up all the time and scaling up. And again, not doing it just because we got to check the boxes, but doing it because we want to be better administrators and better leaders. Um, being able to have a bench so that when someone is not there or someone gets transferred out or someone gets terminated or whatever happens in your school, that you have a bench already set up for the next person coming off the bench to be able to do um, the, to what the students need. Um, but that training is very important, making sure that we have training that makes sense for your school and for the administrators um, and for your students. But beyond the students, your, your teachers, your counselors, your guidance counselors, your attendance officers, um, all the way down to the janitor, right? Because the janitor is most important in the building all the way up to the top. And how are they trained, right? Are they trained on, on trauma-informed practices? Um, are they trained in, you know, customers? Or are they trained in how to just identify uh, when students don't feel safe? Um, but we're not just talking about, like, 
guns and, and, and physical violence. We're talking sexual violence, right? Because we know that a lot of our students um, are struggling with sexual abuse, um, domestic violence abuse. They are exposed to domestic violence so much earlier now than before. And we don't address those issues um, or we refer them out to people that we don't necessarily know if they're going to do a good job. And sometimes we cause more harm when we do that. Um, having crisis plans and safety plans for students and success plans for students is important. Um, a lot of what I do is create safety plans for students in schools because what looks what safety in the school is different when they in the neighborhood. And because I'm outside in the neighborhoods, I can tell you what's happening in their neighborhood. I can tell you things that are going on, them being included in it that you won't ever know as school administrators. And so having that relationship outside the school with partners is important to create safety plans for, for the students. That last part, you, you, you just said something that's going to keep me stuck right here. You said they're engaged in things, involved in things after school, away from school, outside of school that the administration will never know of. Right. And that's absolutely correct. So so my question to you, given everything that you just said, how can like I'm 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 administrator and I, I really don't know these neighborhoods like that. I'm 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 from another environment, right? But 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 for whatever the reason they hired me. So I, I come to Newark, I come to Detroit, I come to Houston, I come to Dallas, I come to Miami, right? I come to Cleveland, whatever it is. I'm I'm in I'm in these big cities or I'm in these smaller cities that have the same challenges. But I don't know these environments. I get back in the car and I drive back to where I live, where I, which is reflective of where I grew up. What do you say to that leader that doesn't know, as people would say, some of these concrete jungles where a lot of this stuff goes on that's, that's not part of their world? How do they become informed? So they become informed because most of the cities that you name now, as I'm a director of the Office of Violence Prevention for the city of Newark, but most cities now have um, an Office of Violence Prevention. Most cities have an Office of Neighborhood Safety Services. And those are your credible messengers. Those are your people who know what's happening in the neighborhoods. Those are your people who are nine times out of 10 um, going to be able to tell you what's happening. And those are the relationships that you need to build. Um, and so in the city of Newark, Detroit, like you said, um, in California, in Cleveland, in um, New Orleans, um, in Philly and in DC, right? Um, we have offices of violence prevention because the numbers are so high in terms of things that are happening and the people who know, so they say the people who are closest to the problem is closest to the solution, right? And you have to go and, and not be afraid to activate them and connect them to your school, even though the policy says they can't come in because they may have criminal backgrounds even though the policy says, so we gotta create a way to still be connected to them because those are the people that can stop things overnight. And so for me, I have um, a, a entity that I just created called One Hood. And it's, I went into the 20 hot spots in the city where crime and violence is happening. And I went and got people who are loved, respected and influ influential people in those neighborhoods and I brought them together. And it's powerful because you're never going to get these folks in a room together, Bloods, Crips, Latin Kings, and people that's just neighborhood leaders in different neighborhoods, not necessarily gangbangers I'm not, or, or people in street organizations. I'm saying people who are influential. And so when we implemented that strategy for high risk intervention, we were able to cut our numbers almost overnight in terms of car thefts, in terms of shootings, robberies, all sorts of things, because they are connected to the people that's doing it. And so we at the basketball game. And so we see a, a, a set of young people that sit in there and I got their leader or the person who knows what's happening or people they listen to and respect sitting there at the basketball game. And so oh, right in the moment, nothing is happening because they said so. Right. We're not doing nothing. Y'all going to stand down. We here. We coming in peace. Right. And we push in peace. And that's all we doing. If a stolen car happens, we know the stolen car crew, our young people who are 13, 14, 15 are the ones stealing the most cars. And so if we need that car back, if they steal Principal Cafele's car, I need that car back right now. Those are relationships that you need. We have missing children. Oh, my kid is missing. He didn't come home from school. Okay, I know where he at because I know where the house at that they hang out at. And I'll send my guy over there and he gonna bring him right home. 
oh, he's involved in some other stuff, but we gonna go get him. People that's not afraid. So we're standing outside the schools every day. We on the lunch periods, we at the inside, outside, but there are some um, policies that stop us from being able to go in and do that. But we're able to tell the, the teachers and the administrators, you have a few of the students where other students are not safe, right? And we have to create safety plans. And so I would say to the administrators, connect to those community-based organizations. Don't be afraid to tap into them. Don't be afraid to allow them to lead and do outreach. Um, don't be afraid to allow them to do mediations. We doing conflict resolution. We doing mediations right on the spot. You have an issue with this kid? Come on, let's go talk about it right now. Let's figure this out. And sometimes even old school, right? Because we know that there's an increase in, in, in gun violence that we are you know, going back to basics to, to tell kids how to resolve conflict without having to result to guns. How to not get cyber bullied because we see this happening on the internet. Kids stomping each other out. Last weekend, we had a principal that got hurt at the basketball game trying to cover a kid from getting beat up. And so we knew about that incident way ahead of time. So we need to communicate. So we could have communicated that to the principal to say, hey, you might want to not have spectators at the game because this is what's brewing outside. Mm. So I would say to administrators to get ahead of it um, and to talk to those people in the community that know what's going on, connect to your local violence prevention offices, your local um, hubs, your local um, community based organizations, your local activist organizations um, and work in partnership with them. You said a lot there. That, that, that was some powerful stuff, man. Y'all taking notes out there? That was a lot there. You know, you know what you said, it resonated with me on so many levels. I remember when I was a middle school principal, Keisha, um, my relationship with so many of the students in that building, Sojourner Truth Middle School, was, was absolutely solid. Mm -hmm. So but stuff would happen from time to time. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a new principal. I'm still trying to figure it out. I'm an urban press. Stuff is happening from time to time. Right. But because of those relationships, and there was no such thing yet as email. I'm going way back now. <laughs> and I see Brother Otto was on here, so he knows something about this. He was he was on my staff back then. So I would get on my PA and I would say XYZ just happened. I need to know who's responsible within the next five minutes y'all now we didn't have emails i had this box <laughs> you can go through channels to get me that message right however you do it but i need to know and and, and i promise you keisha i am not lying on this on this live stream five minutes i'm informed i know exactly what went down yeah and, and now i can deal with it because of the relationships as leader that i have with every youngster in that school and sometimes the one that that, that that violated the rule, you know, did whatever. I, I I really don't want to use that word culprit, but the one who was in the wrong was still someone close to me, but he's so young, he don't realize he's doing something so egregious. So, but it put me in position. I right, now we now I gotta build this relationship. But the bottom line, I I, I even share this, it was the relationship. Yes, yeah. Peter, relationship based and school. It matters, it matters, it does. You know, you you talk about ecosystems a lot, and 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 here you 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 talk about this this you you having to have relationship in your capacity with superintendents and and principals as key components to this ecosystem that you're referring to. And I want you to explain that ecosystem, but but that you're building as a as a model for the city, and I wrote by extension the nation, right? So my question to you. Where do the schools fit into this ecosystem and what do you mean by ecosystem? Right. So, you know, the ecosystem is ultimately what we need in order to survive and live. Right. We know that one is connected to the other, the, the, the connections and the um, interactions that we have is is huge. And so um what I find is we need everybody in order to win. And if everybody can just stay in their lanes, right, this is this is what we, we ultimately build in, just stay in your lanes, then we can win, you know, at a, at a higher capacity. And so in the city of Newark and the other cities are building ecosystems as well. Um, but we I funded seven different areas um, in the work and um, we funded um, 
trauma recovery services, um, school base, which is safe passage, high risk intervention, domestic violence, victim services, therapeutic and clinical services. Um, and I'm missing one or two, but in the seven areas, what it is is that you find people in each of those areas that can provide those services and we're able to, well, it's bigger than a wraparound, right? It is ultimately being able to have, we have the hospitals, right? We have a hospital-based violence intervention program that if someone is injured and comes to the hospital, they get a person bedside to help advocate for them from the time they're admitted to the time that they're discharged. Because again, that trust is important and trust building. And when they go into the hospital, most times they're going to have to talk to the police, right? So we're trying to create some alternatives to law enforcement, alternatives to policing, because we know that policing and law enforcement can't do everything. We don't want them to do everything and they can't be everything. And so we ultimately create an alternatives to law enforcement and policing. Um, and so we have hospitals, we have school-based, um, we have um, trauma, we have domestic, all of the different entities. And so what happens is we, we have these people that come to the table once a month and we are looking at the data and the data is telling us in the hot spots what's happening. And so we are using the data to inform the schools, to inform the organizations on how we can strategize. Um, so it's a it's a database strategy, right? And it's a relationship based strategy where we are solving and learning how to make the community safer, how to do public safety from a community based place, how to approach violence from a public health issue, right? From a public health approach. Um, and so it's really all of those entities um, working together to be able to help the community move forward and the school systems fit right at the center because they see the kids, right? And the families, most, they see them most of the days, Monday through Friday, you know, so they have the first hand on them and it's ultimately asking them to now refer or be able to um, do something for the, and wrap around all of the resources. So we are putting resources you know, into the hands, because ultimately what we find is that the least amount of resources, the more, you know, issues we have. So we are pumping resources into that entity. So for the school-based entity, we're working in partnership with the school superintendent. He sits at the table. We have access. Um, for us, our board of education vice president works for the Office of Violence Prevention right or is embedded or a part of the office of violence prevention so we have a relationship um and so we are working we go and we talk to the school principals they give us access to come talk to the school principals to tell them what resources we have how we can help them how we can help families um and so it's a, a continuous communication because is that what, collectively with the principals or is that individually say it again sorry is that collectively with the principals or is that individually it's both. So okay. some some schools have more relationships so we can do some individual with the principals, but we have gone collectively to talk to the principals collectively uh, to, be able, to be able to give us access, to be able to get us information. I saw someone put, you know, the issue around confidentiality, right, and being able to um, share information. So we have a data sharing agreement which is important. We have MOU agreements in place that we can share information, certain information, not all information. Um, and so making sure we have data sharing agreements, um, memorandums of understandings, um, if there's a, a student or a family that you know, needs more than the school can provide and they, they need our assistance and help, then we intervene because I have social workers on my staff. I have um, victim advocates, outreach workers on my staff that's also certified, licensed, um, and also knows the work. So we're not violating any of the, the issues, the, the policies, um, but we also know that some of the policies need to change. And sometimes we border, right, breaking policies sometimes to help these families and to help the students. But we know that because students now get to go to any school they want and they're going across the city before you just went around the corner and you walk to school and that's not the case anymore. You have to go all the way across town. You got to catch a bus or Uber, however students are getting to school. And now your safety is the issue. Safety, um, many students don't feel safe because they have to travel across borders in order to get to school now. 
and they're now exposed to different things, um, different cultures um, and different things. And so really having to create a different sense of public safety for our students, but that relationship is important with students and, and administrators, with the community, the ecosystem, being connected to the ecosystem gives you more resources. So if you have 30 resources within the district, with my office, you now have 70 because I got 40. Mm. And so the more we have, the more options we have, the more sustainability, we ultimately are trying to create some sustainability, but the more we have, the more options, the more, um, we are able to help the families, help the community, help our administrators, help our students um, to be able to thrive, to grow. Um, so the more we have, the more we have. I love it. You know, let, let me let me holler at the fam out there real quick. Hey, listen, y'all, I, I have a lot of I, I got I got several more questions to ask. Right. Um, but it's it's like it's 12 o'clock now, Eastern time, 12 or three to be exact. Keisha, let, let them know. I want them to know that you're not just um, the director of the Office of um, of, of Violence and, and Trauma Recovery, but you're also a presenter. Um, you also go out and you train, you teach, okay. keynote, you lecture and all that. So let, let the folks know um, your, your website or how the best way to reach you so that they can bring you in to get more of you. Um, so my, I'm getting my website. It should be launched probably by the new year. Um, but my name, right, Keisha Yuri, is on Facebook, Keisha Yuri on Instagram, um, and also on LinkedIn. Um, I do presentations. Um, I have done presentations on the impact of trauma on school officials um, and school leaders um, and different types of trainings um, in terms of social emotional learning, how to connect to community, um, how administrators um can you know connect better with students but not necessarily connect better but it's more that community-based place um some of the policies um but i do presentations i do workshops and i do trainings um and really honing in on those areas that we know are non-traditional that we know um that we can't always talk about publicly but we know that some administrators are struggling with some things internally but how to create safety plans for students outside of the school um and so how to build an ecosystem within your school and outside your school. So my specialty is ecosystem building. My specialty is organizing um, workshops, trainings. Um, but ultimately, trauma is the work that I do. And a lot of the root causes of what we're experiencing with our students and our families and our administrators as well is trauma. Good stuff. So you 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 all hear how to reach Keisha uh, to bring her in to get more than what you're getting here on um, in week 191. Let's go. You know, Keisha, I'm um I'm known to say that the assistant principalship is the most misunderstood and underutilized position in all of education. Mm -hmm. It's a mess. But I also am known to say that the counselor is a close second. The school counselor, some people still say guidance counselor, but the school counselor, um, I, I, I say is so misunderstood and so underutilized relative to the time that they're able to devote to okay. students versus non-student responsibilities. So putting that social worker's hat on yet again, what is your message to, because it's because it's not necessarily on the counselor, it's it's on how that counselor is being utilized. So if that counselor is a full time testing coordinator for if that counselor plays any kind of role in discipline and so many other aspects of the work that have nothing to do with helping a youngster to get from point A to point B. Then, 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 then my, my question to you is, what is your message to that urban principal and AP in particular? relative to how they utilize their school counselors toward ultimately, in this case, curbing violence in their schools or even addressing trauma within the school. So I would say to them as I talk to myself, right, as an administrator, right, that you got to find um, where people best fit, right? So we're on a bus, we have a lot of people who are not in the right seat on the bus. And so we put them in the seat because we just need them to be there. Um, and so that's not their best skill. That's not their best attribute. And sometimes they cause more harm in that space. Um, and so I would say to to really do like thorough evaluations. Many times we are hiring people that we know. Right. Because of the relationship, they are family, they are friends um, or they've been there for a long time. 
but they again they're not on the right seat on the bus um and so sometimes the driver is not in the right seat either um and so i would say to do like a, a real deep dive and really take a look at um moving people where they really need to be um so that we can get the best results right so that we can go further faster um and so for our counselors a lot of times we feel like you just get dumped on you feel like they give you students that that are impossible to work with or families that are impossible to work with and you don't know what to do with them and sometimes they need to be out of district or sometimes they need to be homeschooled or sometimes they just need something different that you can't give to them but you're trying your best to give it to them um and so we got to be honest about um where we are on the bus and that we don't cause more harm trying to do something that we that's just not our skill area um and so as school counselors connect to people outside of the school connect to people who are connected to these students try to connect with them very differently and also for our teachers right many of our teachers right we have our own traumas and so again because we haven't dealt with our own stuff, then we begin to bleed on, on our students sometimes, or we begin to bleed on other people around us and we create a negative you know, energy because we haven't dealt with our own stress, being overwhelmed, being underpaid, being underappreciated, just here because I need you know, to be here um, and whatever, or being burnt out, having depression, stress, anxiety, all of these things that we deal with just as being human beings. And we come to work every day thinking that we're doing a good job and sometimes we're bleeding on other people and we're not. So I would say for those school administrators to encourage your, 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 the people that you um, lead to get the help that they need. Encourage them to go to therapy, to get coaching, to get whatever they need for their spirit um, so that they can be better administrators for the people that we're trying to help and to get on the right seat on the bus. I love it. You know, D Dr. Sheikha Houston um, posed this question to you a, a little bit earlier. She said, if, if, if there's time, what, what does a safety plan sound like for mm -hmm. a student? So a safety plan looks like you're asking the student, um, if they have places that they feel safe, where they that they're safe places, right? So if mom and dad is in a domestic violence situation and the kid has to go home every day to this, um, who are those people that support you? Who are those people that you can identify in the community or in your family that if you needed to go there, they can go there? Um, where do you where is it safe in your house? Um, who who are the people you feel safe with? Where are the safe places? What helps you to feel safe? When do you feel the safest and why? Um, and so the, the last one is really the why you, you don't feel safe or what, what triggers you not feeling safe so that we don't brush up against those things. So a lot of times, we again, we're trying to do, we're helping, but we're doing more harm. And we don't know that we're brushing up against people's um, triggers and they don't feel safe. Um, when, and, and people who have issues around touch, right? Because they've been touched inappropriately. And a lot of times we think we're doing great by holding them, hugging them, touching them, and we're causing more harm. Do you feel safe when you're, you, when you're being hugged? Do you feel safe when you're being held? And if that's no, then that's a no. And we got to ask those questions. Um, do you feel safe where you live? Inside the house may be fine, but outside the house? No. And when they on their way to school, do you feel safe on your route to school? Right. And those are very different questions. Um, and we don't necessarily ask those questions. Um, do you feel safe with your administrators and your teachers? We don't ask those questions. Right. Who do you feel safest with? Um, and so that, that's how you ultimately do a safety plan. And once you assess the safety, then we come up with, with goals. Where do where to go? So if mom and dad is fighting today, you don't go home, you go to Miss Williams' house across the street. If on your way to school, you see that there was a shooting or something happened or, the, or it's not safe, how do you find an alternative way to get to school versus not coming to school at all, right? So my, most of them just like, I'm just not going. How do you help them find alternative routes? Um, so it's, it's really going through um, helping them find alternatives versus it just, it's just being an all or nothing. Um, 
but I have some safety plans. I can, you know, send them out for folks and I can train on them if you need me to. Um, but, and that's safety for the student as an individual, but also we have safety plans for the school itself when school environments themselves are not safe for students. You sure do have a lot of resources. Wow. And I know Dr. Houston, she says she's going to be in touch with you. <laughs> right. So good stuff. You know, you you um out of your office, you're, you're building this re-engagement plan um, for disengaged students who have dropped out of school or who have other attendance issues. Talk to us about that, because that's an issue for a lot of folks, particularly at the second level, secondary level. But it starts in the lower grades. Right. And so, again, once we start to see the absenteeism rate or well, students not coming to school at the rate that they used to. We know COVID, you know, displaced a lot of students and many of them just didn't come back or at home was just, you know, the place. But for us in the city, we had over like 4,000 students um, that was displaced. Um, and so where are they? Because we didn't recover all of them. Um, and so that's a real question for school leaders because we are most times just concerned about our roster and that's all we care about. But those students that we don't care about are connected to those students that we do care about. So they can't wait to get outside to be with the ones who are not in school, who didn't come to school and they're connected to them. So we, the re-engagement center um, is that we are connecting them back to school and it may not be traditional. So it's school, it's a training program, it's a social service agency, it's a social emo emotional piece. So we are connecting them back into what they're missing. And what we find is those students who are the ones that are missing are the ones who are most times um, stealing cars, getting incarcerated, they're our shooters, they're our um, ones that are being in and out of, of jail, they're on these ankle bracelets. Um, and some of them are not, some of them are our athletes, some of them do well, right, academically, but they're just not engaged socially. Um, or emotionally, or they, they're bored, or whatever the, the situation is, they don't feel connected to anyone in the school, or to the activities, or to the administrators, and it's just not a good fit, again, on the bus. So we have students who are in schools, so that's just not good fits for them, therefore they don't come. Um, so the re-engagement center re-engages them back into an entity, so it may not be right back into school first, but it might be at Principal Kefele's life skills program, they go first to. And then we might enroll them into a training program or they might be in the Mayor's Leadership Academy. We have a Leadership Academy every Saturday for our young people. Um, so they may go to the Leadership Academy but we, or they may get a, a, a job, but we have to engage them in something. And then from there, we can engage them and do um, success plans for them to be able to get them back on the road. But we have so many young people that are disengaged, dropped out, and because of trauma, and I know we, we don't necessarily want to talk about it, but we have the Newark Street Academy here, where it's for disengaged students who, because I got pregnant, I had to drop out. Because I had to take care of my mother and my family, I had to drop out. Because my brother got shot and I said, I don't want to be bothered with the world, I dropped out. And so how do we re-engage them back? And because many of them have issues around poverty, then we have we are providing stipends or a way for them to get money or do an earn to learn program and being creative and how we re-engage them back into some sort of learning um, systems. Well, wow. and you know, um, you know, also thinking about just dealing with the the challenges of being in a school you talked about as it relates to violence you talked about the the safe passage program outside of school and in particularly around this season basketball games going on and all you know all these all the schools are playing in the tournaments etc but what about in the lunch cafeteria what 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 might that look like so that looks like us being able to get into the school on the lunch period because what we find is that I have some outreach workers and social workers that are allowed into the schools just to engage with them, just to do wellness checks and check-ins. We're not asking them anything other than how you doing, right? And so what we find is you know how you go into the mall and, and you walk in and people ask, hello, how are you? Hello, how are you? Customers are all throughout, right? And so while we think it's just customer service and people being um, courteous to us, it's really like a, a, a 
to be able to decrease loss prevention. It's a loss prevention strategy, right? So if I said hi to you and two other people said hi to you, we have put eyes on you three times in the store before you walk out. And if you want to walk out with something, at least three people saw you before you walked out with it. Similar to, you know, this strategy here with students. We uh, at the lunch periods, if we're there in the morning outside the school, somebody put eyes on you, said, hello, how are you? If we come in on the lunch period, we just doing wellness checks. How was your day? How you doing? What's going on in your world? Not really engaging in a huge conversation, but just letting you know that you're seen. And if we're outside after school, we've seen you again three times in that day. And if you go to the after school program, we've seen you. And so it's a it's a loss prevention strategy, right? And so being able to just check in with them and they'll be able to tell you too if a fight is going to happen after school or if something is brewing, you're going to be able to feel and know the energy if you continuously do those wellness checks. So the lunch periods are important um, for, for um, organizations and, and people who are not necessarily school staff to be able to come in and to be able to just relate to the students and them having people that's relatable to them and they may be able, that they build trust with. And that's the biggest thing, loss prevention strategy and building trust with our students helps us to, to keep them safe, keep the school safe, um, keep the community safe. I love that and it, it resonates again. I'm, you know, I'm thinking about just me and my principal capacity and, and sitting at a different lunch table every day during those lunch periods, getting to know them kids on different levels and never having a conversation about education. Right. I can talk about education anytime. Let me let me let me let me talk about things that they relate to. Let me let right. me delve into their world, you know, in, in terms of how deep they want to take me into it. But but those relationships forming right there in that cafeteria you know um folks i got i got four more questions to the fam out there but before i go to my four and i want to i want to delve into trauma a little bit i want to i want you to share with the with the folks keisha um you got a late call last night could you um as much as you can could you could you talk to us about that in terms of just how you how you know the the, the life you chose to live and what last night looked like for you so, and just an overview too quickly for the Office of Violence Prevention. Um, the Office of Violence Prevention um, was formed in the wake of George Floyd and the rally and cry, cries around defunding of the police. Yeah. Um, and so what the city of Newark did was we signed the executive order to be able to um, reallocate 5% of the police department's budget to be able to respond to crime and violence in the city differently than law enforcement. And so, you know, while there were some people who were happy, there were some people who weren't happy about that, right? The, the, the thought or the notion of, you know, taking money from police is, is still, you know, an a issue, but really being able to, if our budget is 235 and $245 million, every city's public safety budget is the biggest budget in every city. And their budget doesn't get cut, whether they do a good job or a bad job, their budget continues to get increased. And so we decided to tap into that budget because we are at the scenes when law enforcement is there. So if we have a shooting, a robbing, a stabbing, a carjacking or anything that happens, you have people like myself and other organizations who get deployed out to those, those incidents to be able to help the families, to be able to support families, to be able to support people who've been victims of violence and crime. Because you want to have someone to show up that looks like them, that's relatable to them. And law enforcement is not always that person. Um, and so we go to all shootings um, and, and other incidents um, and we're able to um, be able to do crowd control if something else may happen. We're able to be the liaison between the family and the hospital. So we go to the hospital scene, we go to the crime scene, we go to the school scene, we go to several places. Um, and so last night we had an incident, um, we had a homicide in the city. Um, and so we had a shooting incident and you know the person was shot several times and unfortunately he didn't make it. Um, but I have a team that gets deployed there my social workers and outreach workers, and we're there consoling families. We're there trying to assess if there's going to be a retaliation. And so we go to all suicides, homicides, shooting incidents. And this week we had a 13 year old that was shot. Um, and he survived and, and by the grace of God, he survived. Um, but we have our young people who are being shot as well. And so the trauma associated with that 
is is huge because it has lasting effects. Um, and so for the city of Newark last year, we finished at 50 homicides, which was a 60 year low for the city because we used to have over 100 homicides when the anti-violence coalition started. We had over 100 homicides. And so to be able to cut that down to 50, and now this year we are at, as of last night, the one that just happened, 44, 45, but we're trying to come under the numbers, but the investment that's made is what's helping to be able to, to cut that. The, um, the resources that's attached, because we never had an investment before. We never had resources attached to community-based violence, um, youth violence, our children, are at the helm of a lot of these um, because they have access to guns. And I'm not sure where the access is coming from, but we have an increase in youth violence and all of these youth are attached to a school. And so we have mass shootings. We have all of these different things that are happening and we're looking to be able to come up with strategies. The ecosystem is a strategy to be able to, um, to tackle these issues. Um, but ultimately, I respond to all shootings, homicides, suicides, um, incidents of violence, domestic violence. Um, we had another homicide this week that was a domestic violence situation. Um, and so I'm responsible for sexual violence, gun violence, community violence, domestic violence, and to be able to um, intervene into those things. A lot of that's, that's, that's a lot on your plate. It's a lot of work, but um, I'm, they got the right person that's in charge of that department. You know, um, let's let's transition to trauma. I just mm -hmm. I just got a couple questions for you. An, an exaggerated couple. Um, keeping your social worker hat on. Where, where in your estimation, Keisha, are, are we getting it wrong with addressing trauma as it relates to children in schools? Um, we're getting it wrong because we don't even address it. We don't think that they have it right, and we we're not identifying it and labeling it and the ones of them that are labeled that are classified that are getting services that are um doing um that are classified um we look at it on the on that on the exaggerated level many of them are on medication right and so again because we come from um historical trauma right in communities the historical and generational trauma is a real place um and so we still stigmatize trauma um, and mental health as a bad thing. And we don't want to address mental health issues. Uh, we don't want to address emotional issues. We don't want to address grief and loss. And in our communities, we have a tremendous amount of grief and loss. Um, and we just go business as usual, like, oh, well, it just happens. When we ask students, have you ever been a victim of violence? They like, no. And I say, raise your hand if you ever gotten jumped before and they raised their hand and I'm like you were a victim of violence and they like no it was just a fight mm. right and it's like no it wasn't just a fight right raise your hand if you've been chased home from school before raise your hand if when you got home you didn't know um, if you was going to have food to eat and if your mother was going to be home or not raise your hand and then the hands go up and I'm looking at them like this is trauma yeah. right and so being able to name it for them because nobody wants to say it's, it's me. Nobody wants to say I have I have an issue um, because it, it's a sign of weakness. Right. It's a sign of vulnerability. And in our communities and our societies, you can't be vulnerable because vulnerability and weakness equals. Right. It can be a life or death situation. It just reads differently. Um, and so trauma um, is, is anything that happens to you, the event, the effect that it has on you. Right. And so it's lasting effects and many of us don't necessarily recognize it. So the loss of my parents was traumatic for me. Right. The person coming to knock on my door to shoot my brother and it could have possibly been me was traumatic for me. But I just said it's as, oh, this is just life being in a neighborhood. It just happens. Right. Um, us having medical issues. Right. Being diabetic and high blood pressure generationally in our families. Right. Um, cancer is taken out and killing a lot of our people generationally. Um, and so we have to recognize it and know it. And so um, we need to certainly, once we recognize it, we got to do something about it and do something differently. And so our young people can't articulate 
their trauma that they're feeling most times. And so they're acting it out. And so one of the young kids that I had came to my office, he was 13. Um, and he said, he's in one of the BD classes. And he said, my teacher um, said to me, you're going to be just like your father. You're going to end up just where your father at. And he said, how you know with my father? They said, we know everything. Your father's in jail doing 20, 30 years and you're going to be there too. Mm -hmm. And so for the teacher and administrator to say that to him, he, so I said, what did you do? He said, I cursed out and I trashed the class and I walked out. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, why did you do that? He said, because she, she disrespected me. And I said, okay, how do we deal with that differently? And trying to teach him conflict resolution when he was hurt. Yeah. And so many of the students can't identify their hurt. Many of our teachers can't identify their hurt. And so they're not going to use the word hurt, you know, felt disrespected and, and the words that we need to express ourselves. They just it just be anger. Right. And so anger comes out. Right. And ultimately becomes violence. Um, but really hoping to be able to identify feelings. How are you feel? I'm good. No, I need you to what's good. Right. How are you truly feeling? Yeah. And so asking administrators and teachers to have a feelings wheel or the feelings paper in a classroom to identify feelings. Um, because if I can identify it, then I'm less frustrated trying to articulate it. Um, and then I don't feel embarrassed because I can't. Right. And so that's traumatic when they can't express feelings, when they can't um, articulate their thoughts, when they are not, you know, necessarily on track. And some of them are like we have students who are thriving academically, but they're not thriving emotionally and socially because of traumatic incidents that may be environmental, that may be, you know, direct or indirect. Um, and so they're experiencing individual trauma, collective trauma, historical trauma, generational trauma. And we also know that there's trauma that is passed through genetics that had, that you had nothing to do with. It was passed through your genetics from your mother and father down through the genes. And many of us don't believe in that, but it's called epigenetics. Trauma can be passed genetically. You said a lot. I want to say to the fam again, um, social media, Keisha Yuri, get in touch with her. She'll come on out to your school and break it all down in a workshop, right? Or if your conference, break it down in a keynote address, whatever it is you got set up, uh, your, your school as far as PD, professional learning, in-service day, Keisha Yuri, Facebook, Twitter. I mean, I'm sorry, uh, Instagram, uh, reach out to, because I don't think you're on Twitter, right? Or are no, you? not Twitter. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Yeah, and LinkedIn, right? Reach out to her. I'm, I'm winding up. You know, I, you, you have a program out of your office again. Um, it's called the Guaranteed Education Program, which sends students to college who have a 1.9 through a 2.5 with the stipulation that they have experienced trauma or have a parent incarcerated um, or experienced homelessness or other forms of trauma, all expenses paid. That's phenomenal. Talk to us about that. So that is through our, um, our Brick City Peace Collective. Mayor Baraka, um, ultimately the Office of Violence Prevention has a wing, um, which is the Brick City Peace Collective which is the wing that collaborates and partners all the organizations together, that coordinates all of those organizations that we fund in the community to do work, but ultimately also holds them accountable. And because we're holding you know, all of the partners accountable, the Board of Education is a partner. And so what we found is that our young people, we have a, a, a group of young people, the data told us that students with like a 1.9 or below you know, or even up to the 2.5 had less of a chance of being able to, you know, go to college. Um, and ultimately, those students are the ones that have experienced something. And again, with the safety plans, we were able to talk to them and understand what happened. Right. So trauma is really about not what's wrong with someone, but what happened to them. And when you're trauma informed, that's the lens that you look at it from. It's not oh, what's wrong with them? It's what happened to them. And you begin to ask questions differently when you say what happened and say when they begin to tell you what happened, then you're able to build a, a relationship and they're not, you're not blaming them for what's happening. And so we begin to see that our young people who didn't have the, the best GPAs had experienced loss 
at a, at a great deal, had experienced a parent being incarcerated, had experienced a parent having substance homelessness. We know that housing is a huge issue. We have so many students right now that are homeless. And before we didn't really experience that, but homelessness is huge. Yeah. And so I can't perform if I'm trying to figure out where I'm going to live or sleep tonight. I can't perform if I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to eat, food, clothing, shelter, transportation, how I'm going to get there, all of those things. So once we're able to take away some of those barriers, then we're able to work with them. But if I can't function and focus, then the, those my grades are going to reflect that and show that. But we also have some students who thrive, who have 3.0 GPAs, but are experiencing loss and all of those things. And school is their only outlet. And they show up every day, um, but you would never know that they've been sexually assaulted, that they have a parent incarcerated, that they, the grandmother's taking care of them on a hope and a prayer, right? All of those social issues. And we just say they need to just come to school and learn, but how? And so what we, we learned is that we, we threw the data that we had, we um, asked them these questions and we found the overwhelming amount of them had experienced some sort of trauma. Um, and some of them themselves have been victims of violence directly. And so we did a cohort, 40 students there um, at St. Elizabeth University. Um, and we are sponsoring them to go on a full ride to be able to pay for school for them so that they don't have that added extra pressure to figure out how they're going to pay for it. And then we couple them with social workers that's from the community, from not just the counselors at the school, we got social workers from our community that go and work with them, talk to them. Then we give them mentors. We give them peer coaching. We give because they need more. Right. And so we talk the thing that, you know, equity versus, you know, equality. Some people just need more. And so we are giving them more so that they can be successful. And that is through the city, through the Brick City Peace Collective. It's, through, it's a grant based program. And we are funding students who've experienced trauma because we know they would never have the opportunity or assert themselves to be able to, to uh, embrace the opportunity on their own. Powerful stuff. You know, I got, I got one more for you. Then we go to our rapid fire. Why, why is it important that the office of violence and, and, and uh, violence prevention and trauma recovery is replicated throughout America? So we have several offices of violence prevention in several cities now, um, but the trauma recovery piece is the most important, right? Because we know recovery is a process. We know recovery is forever. And so if we're just preventing, right? And we have, for my office, we have a prevention side, an intervention side, and then a, uh, a treatment side. And the side that we don't do well in is treatment. And so I am increasing and working hard on the treatment side. And treatment may look like just having a safe place to come get on a computer. Treatment may look like just food, clothing, shelter, bus tickets for them. Treatment may just be to talk. Treatment may be art. It may be music. It may be them going over to the hub and recording a song in the studio. It may be us just showing up on their block. It may be us showing up at their schools. Um, it may be, you know, those non-traditional things, just taking them out to, 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 the, to eat, to the football game, the basketball game. Um, it may be everything, culture, everything. And so the treatment side is where we're not doing well in. And so I think every city should have a um, Office of Violence Prevention, however, whatever names they call it, but it needs to have a trauma recovery side. The city of Newark, we have four trauma recovery centers. Um, the hospital has a trauma, University Hospital has a trauma recovery center. Um, North Community Street Team has a trauma recovery center, the Office of Violence Prevention and the Hub. Um, and so there's probably more that are opening up, but it's from a community-based place. It's not that clinical medical model, right? So I, I truly want to say that part. The medical model is not ultimately how a lot of our communities relate. And we have to have alternatives to policing, alternatives to the medical model, alternatives to the, the school model, right? That doesn't um, embrace community, that doesn't embrace a trauma-informed approach, that doesn't allow trauma engagement to happen, that doesn't allow people who are activated into the schools. Um, but beyond the schools, the learning institutions, learning happens outside the schools. Learning happens 
before they get there, while they're there and after. And if we don't connect all of the dots, then we're going to continue to, to lose because we are going to lose them. And if we don't address the trauma, if we don't address the mental health needs and the medical needs and the dental needs and the, the social needs, um, then we're going to lose. And I'm not asking the administrators to do that. I'm not asking the counselors to do that. I'm just asking that you make sure it happens. You don't have to do it. Your job is to make sure that it happens. Mm -hmm. You don't have to um, directly do it. You just have to know who can. And your responsibility is to bring in who can or to refer out to who can. Wow. To the fam out there, I'm, I'm, I'm right there at the end getting ready to go to these BAM impact questions. But what a powerful session. Whole lot of information. And I, I'll be honest with you. I didn't ask her every question I had on the agenda. <laughs> Right. But uh, but let's go to these rapid fire. Hey, Keisha, these are one sentence or one word answers only. If you feel yourself getting ready to go deep, catch yourself. OK, it's, it's rapid fire. Here we go. Is education on the right path for underserved children in America today? Yes. On the right path. Not quite there. Are you optimistic about the educational prospects for the masses of black, brown and other un underserved students in America? I'm always hopeful. I want them to connect with community and I'll be even more hopeful. Can true equity occur in America's schools for black, brown and other underserved students? I don't know if true equity can happen if we don't change policies and we don't understand the systems that we are part of. Does Keisha Yuri's work contribute to the progress we desperately need? Absolutely. If she don't contribute, then no one contributes. If you could do a reset on your life, would your line of work be different or the same? It would be the same. Why do you continue to do this work? Because I have an obligation to those who came before me and because my mother and father needs to be proud of me. What fires you up within the work that you do? Being outside uh, with community on the streets, being able to touch and see and be a part of um, the change in the community. And, and comparable question, but what do you absolutely love about this work? I love the change, the transformation. I love being able to have a seat at the table. I love being able to go where people know your name and they know that you did the best that you could with what you had. What do you dislike about the work you do? Politics. The politics is hard. Um, and sometimes um, you feel like you do the impossible for the ungrateful. Mm -hmm. What has been your greatest victory in this work thus far? Um, the greatest victory is being able to um, reallocate funds, refunding the community, being able to give funds and, and, and give money back to the people who've been doing the work for free for so long. What's been your greatest mistake in this work? Believing that change is going to happen overnight and it was going to happen fast. What has been your greatest challenge in this work? Finding the right people on a bus, putting the right people in place um, and having discernment to be able to know who's in the right place at the right time. Who inspires you in your work? Um, probably more than probably the mayor, more than anyone, because when he ran his campaign, he said, when I become mayor, we become mayor. Yeah. And I took that for real and became mayor or seeing what he was doing and tried to replicate and be able to match and model um, his word. I normally ask, what are you reading now? But with your schedule, I don't know. But what are you reading? Book, blog, article, tweet, anything? What am I reading now? Um, nothing. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm listening to like um, just different people in terms of um, just inspiration. So I'm just listening to self-help and inspirational um, audio books. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. You know, if someone asked me what book I'm reading right now, I'd have to say to them, I'm, I'm not. I, I, I do read articles. I do read blog posts. But um, a book with the kind of schedule I have, it's an impossibility right now. I'll fall asleep on a plane if I try to read a book. Mm -hmm. um, but what book would you recommend to our viewers right now? Um, I would recommend The Body Keeps the Score, um, which is about trauma and how it affects your, your, your body and, your, and your, your system. But that would be one of the, the books that I would recommend. And 
um, to my grandmother's hands. What do you want to accomplish that you haven't accomplished yet? Uh, I would like to be able to do a bit more um, like national work, being able to to be able to write a book. So I haven't been able to write a book and I haven't been able to finish my Ph.D. I dropped out twice. So I need to finish this Ph.D. or not, because it may not be meant for me to have. Right. Everybody don't need a Ph.D. Everybody don't need a doctorate. And I may be one of those people. So maybe my doctorate with a question mark and but to write the book on how to transform cities. Yeah, well, I, I, I'll show you how to get that done. Are you satisfied with where you are professionally right now? Um, I'm OK. Never satisfied. But I definitely think that I'm in a great space and a great place to be able to um, move up and make change. So really being a change maker and a way maker, I'm, I'm satisfied. What could you say to a viewer out there who's continue who continues to face closed doors? Um, to continue to um, not just knock on a door, but find other ways to get through the door. So you might have to chisel it. You might have to kick it in. You might have to um, knock it down, but not don't keep just knocking quietly. I would say to increase your aggressiveness around how you get through that closed door or if the door may be closed for a reason, then you might got to go through the window. And what could you say to a viewer out there who's lost their fire? I've, I've done it. I've lost my fire quite a few times. The light has been dim quite a few times. I would say to surround yourself with people who has fire, surround yourself with people who can pour into you, um, surround yourself with people who are smarter than you. And lastly, if Keisha, if, if Keisha Yuri was a word in a dictionary, what would be your definition? Mm. Healer. Healer. I like healer. that. I like that. A healer. I'm a wounded healer. I'm a community healer, um, but a wounded healer. It would be my name. To I, I love it. And, and my main man, Dr. Vincent Stallings, who's the principal of East Orange STEM Academy, said you need to finish. We need you. He's All right, Mr. Vincent. <laughs> Listen, y'all, I see you started with those emojis. So while uh, those of you that didn't or those of you who are not familiar, that's how we applaud our guests. That's how we let our guests know that the guest was appreciated. Hit me with your favorite emojis, whatever they are. Just hit them up. Let 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 Keisha know that this was a worthwhile session, that it resonated with you, that you heard some things you could take back to the school, back to the district, made you go to your mirror and kind of rethink yourself. You know, whatever it is, hit me up, hit me up. I see him, I see him, I see him. And let me get my emoji while we're at it. You know, I use the, the Louisville slugger. So you are... Uh, <laughs> You hit it out the park, man. You went to bat four <laughs> times, grand slam every time, three persons on base. So that's 16 runs, the max, if you bat four times. So great stuff. This was uh, this was tremendous. Let me see what Dawn said right here. She said, we have a reason to be angry. We can't change being black or woman. Wear the name with honor signed a peaceful, angry black woman. Born <laughs> Newark Board of Education. Absolutely. Shout out to Dawn Hands who have been on the grounds in this work from, from inception to she's a 2009 Newark Anti-Violence Coalition member. Yeah. Um, she's been on the grounds for a very long time. She has been a part of school lock-ins where we encourage students to fight for their rights and advocate for themselves. And they locked down the Board of Education um, and we supported some of those efforts. And so teaching students how to advocate and fight for themselves is another thing that i want to add to the for for the for, um, forefront yeah absolutely and here's my brother chris gadston principal of lincoln high school in jersey city right in the building you know i'm uh this 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 was powerful stuff uh we're gonna do this again at some point i don't know when but we we, we gotta come back I, I didn't ask you a lot of things because of time but uh this this is just great 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 solid information tell them one more time how do they how do they reach you to get you, bring you out to their city um please um i'm on facebook that's private so i'm gonna have to accept you um instagram and linkedin but my email address is l e u r e zero two at gmail.com i'll say it again l e u r e zero two at gmail.com so my name is lakeisha yuri so the l is for lakeisha 
Um, so first initial, last name, 02 at gmail.com. There it is. Get in touch, folks. He's accessible. <clears throat> bring her out to your school. Bring her out to your district. Bring her out to your conference, whatever it is. Reach out to her. I'm also on psychology today. So just put my name in. You can find me on psychology today as well. Excellent. Hey, Keisha, stand by while I close out and then we, we holler off, off camera for a minute. Uh, hey, folks, as always, glad you're here. It's, it's, you know, this is a shopping day. I know for a lot of folks, it could be a football day for folks. I'm glad that, you know, we still had you here with us today. So, you know, I'll be back on next Saturday. It'll be the last Saturday in December. You know, we're not shutting down. I don't shut down for nothing. So I'll be here week 192. The Fantastic Four is coming together. So Sean Hurt, Create and Educate with uh, Dr. Sheikah Houston and Dr. Tammy Taylor. Uh, Unlock the Middle with Josh Tovar and Dean Packard. We're going to be together. We're not interviewing. This is going to be, we we, we, we gonna have a round table and we're talking all things education as much as we can within a short period of time. Let me just give you a slight, uh, just a just a little little taste of what we're talking about. Um, spousal, partner, family, friend support of the leadership, how to survive when you leave your existing district to a new one. What do you do when you take over a new school? School politics, women developing their leadership identities in a society that gravitates toward male leadership, support needed for black women in leadership, how are we how are we changing edu in education to meet the current needs of students and in, in, in industry trends? Y'all know we ain't going to cover all this. We're going to pick and choose what we're going to cover. The importance of fathers in the homes, spouses working toward a shared vision. What does it take to become an entrepreneur? Crea creating student voice within your school, creating student culture of value within your school, creating alternatives other than suspension. So, you know, we ain't going to touch all that. You know that. That's uh. That'll take us probably a full 12 hour day, but we're going to cover as much of this as we can. So it's going to be a nice round table. We're going to take some comments too. So just be on here with us. Tell a friend, powerful session to close out 2023. That will be week 192. So we'll see you then. Uh, Facebook Live every Saturday. You know that. Sean, 10 o'clock. Sheikah and Tammy, 1030. Josh and Dean on Sunday night at seven o'clock. You know my books. I'm not putting them on the screen. Just go to Amazon, put in Baruti Cafe Lay, and they'll all come up. Get a book, share it with, get it for a friend, put it in their stocking, right? Visit principalcafelay.com for all my resources. Subscribe, subscribe, subscribe to the vert to the, I was gonna say virtual, to the AP and New Principals Academy YouTube channel, right? Make sure you subscribe to that. I'm trying to get to 20,000 subscribers. We are at 19,800. That in and of itself is phenomenal. 19,800 subscribers to the kid, right? But I want to bring it up to 20,000, right? So um, hit that hit that button and subscribe to it. And then make sure that you like and follow the Facebook page, AP and New Principals Academy. Commentary every Sunday. I'll have a new one tomorrow. Y'all gave me like about 1,200 1200 views on last week's commentary so we're going to do it i turned it into a blog post though so we're going to do another one tomorrow I'll probably be a blog again i got to come up with something in my head but i got a lot up there so we'll figure it out and then lastly your diet man take care of yourselves man eat right eat right i passed up on some things this week right eat right that the exercise you know since i'm not on airplanes until january 2nd i'm in that gym every day every day Worst time of the day. I don't want to be there. But guess what? I make myself go. I don't want to go to the gym. I don't want to walk on a treadmill. I don't want to be in that locker room listening to folks using the N-word. I, I, I just don't want to be in that environment. Sometime I'll, I'll step up. Some days I, I, that ain't my fight, right? But, but I, there's nothing about it that I like. But guess what? I'm going to be there. Guess why? so that I could be here for week 192. That's why, right? So, you know, so you make the right decisions. And then finally, your COVID-19 precautions, whatever you got to do, keep that out of you and any other viruses that are out there. Other than that, have a great, well, thanks for being here. Have a great week off. Have a great holiday season. Kwanzaa, I told you at the, at the top, I'm telling you at the end, we're going to be on every day starting December 26th for the next seven days, eight o'clock, Black Educators Rock, but I'll share it to my page. I'll be on on Kuji Chagalia Day, which is the second day. That'll be Wednesday. 
but my my comrades will be on throughout the week so make sure that you tune tune in every day and check us out man there'll be some good information we're going to tie the seven principles, the Nguzo Sabu, Moja, Kujijagalia, Ujima, Ujima, Nia, Kaumba, Imani. We're going to tie them to education and life, right? So tune in. Other than that, have a great week. Have an extraordinary week. Have your best week yet. Peace. Oh, I see the dog. Peace. My, my daughter's dog will be here in a few hours. Ace is, is getting ready to invade the place. Thumbs up, cock that fist back, one, two, three, bam! Great session today. I see y'all next Saturday, December 30th at 1055.